Good morning and welcome to our Sunday School class this morning. I want to welcome everyone who was here this morning. We got quite a group, a distinguished group, I might add. And uh, we want to welcome you who are walking, watching for us on television. It's great to have you with us. Uh, we're looking at Genesis chapter 19, 1 through 10, verse 15, and verses 40, 24 through 26, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Join me in prayer. Father, this morning we thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you for your spirit that is upon us to give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, as we deal with this difficult text and the issue that uh, it raises up. Again, Lord, we thank you that you are truth. And Lord, again, that we can embrace truth that you give to us because, Lord, it is reliable uh, morning, evening, and, and, and during the day as well that we can, Lord, build our life on. So again, Lord, we just ask your presence here with those, Lord, at home. And Lord, the discussion that we have also, may it be led and guided and directed by you and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we begin our study this morning, you need to know how this specific chapter has been studied and presented by the Christian church. Now, for the conservative branch of the Church of Christ, this passage has been declared as giving damning judgment on homosexuality. The sin that cried out and is great uh, that God addresses is this, as homosexuality, a sexual activity with one another of the same sex. The sin of homosexuality was so horrendous, so pervasive, that it is reported that all the men of the city of Sodom participated in it. And that's kind of chilling, isn't it? In verse 4, all of the men, young, old, in every quarter, the practice of homosexuality by all the men is a reason for this severe judgment of God. Now, the liberals of the Church of Christ interpret this punishment of God against Sodom and Gomorrah as a result of a lack of hospitality. The failure to welcome these angels into the city, to furnish them with a meal, and to provide some kind of housing for the night. Their argument is the severity of this judgment is response to how important hospitality was in the ancient Eastern world. Now, the problem with that interpretation is not only was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed, but who else? The five cities of the plain. How do you explain that? Were they also lacking in hospitality? And third interpretation of this passage is by the progressives. They interpret God's judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah was because of their tolerance of injustice. And they find that in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, where the prophet in a parable portrays Jerusalem as an adulterous wife and has two evil sisters, Samaria and Sodom. Ezekiel declares the sin of Sodom in chapter 16, verse 49. She and her daughters are arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They do not help the poor or the needy. There's where they get this idea, this concept of injustice. But there's a problem. Because what follows, follows verse 49? Verse 50. And this is what verse 50 says. The people of Sodom were haughty and did detestable things before me. And the word detestable is the same word used in Leviticus 18 verse 22 concerning the same sexual behavior of homosexuality. So notice, not only are they condemned for injustice, but also for the detestable thing that they did before God that cried out for judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah has God's attention and focus because of this despicable practice of homosexuality as stated both in Genesis and in the book of Ezekiel. Because who do both authors quote in the book of Genesis and in the book of Ezekiel? They quote the words of the Lord God Jehovah. So with that introduction, we begin with verses 1 through 3. The scene now shifts to Sodom itself, the chief representative 
of the five cities of the plain. And, and here's the plain we're talking about here, okay? And the five cities are Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebion, and Zor. Now, the reason I didn't put down Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebion, I did not know and could not find their exact locations. Okay, so then rather than try to guess or pretend I did, I didn't. But these two cities are going to be important because these the two that are mentioned in uh, our text today, Sodom and Zoar. All right? It was Sodom where Lot and his family gradually migrated and lived. Genesis 13, 12. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. Genesis 14, verse 12, he dwelt in Sodom. And verse 1, he sat in the gate of Sodom. Sodom. Verse 1, the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them, bowed down with his face to the ground. Now, the gate of the city was the place where business and commercial activities were conducted. Also, where the Judicial Council met and made again impending decisions that was the law of the city. Evidently, Lot himself was some kind of city magistrate because the gate of any city was the physical symbol of collective authority and power. Are you impressed that Lot became an official in the city of Sodom? Don't be. Here is a man who participated in one of the highest callings ever given by God to men. Someone who with Abraham had firsthand experience of the revelations of God and the great deliverances he could give. And yet now he is right at home in the midst of the life of a most wicked city that ever disgraced the earth. Notice that when the angels arrive, Lot is the only one who's sitting at the city gate, the focal point of community life, which suggests that he and him alone was concerned about the community's welfare and their interests. Notice, though, how Lot mirrors Abraham as he greets these angelic visitors. What does he do? Not only does he bow, but he bows he bows low. He bows low. Having paid homage to them, he asks them to stay the night and offers to wash their feet. Verse 2. My Lord, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night, then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we'll spend the night in the square. Maybe Lot's invitation was simply a common, hospitable gesture of the East. Possibly, as the chief magistrate of the city, welcoming guests and housing guests was his duty. Or, aware of the treatment that these strangers would receive by the citizens of this city, he tries to take them away from the city square, bring him to his house as quickly as possible without being noticed, seen, or watched. Of those three options, which one do you embrace? <laughs> the last, okay. It could be one of the three. But what's interesting is the angels resist. Now, it's unclear why they first refuse to go to Lot's house when he offers them to stay there. What do you think was happening there? Why did the angels initially deny and reject that offer? Any ideas? Because of his family? Could be that. They could be testing the genuineness of the offer. Okay. Lot presses. He urges them and they finally yield to him their insistence, verse 3. But he insisted so strongly, kind of gives you the idea that he wants to get them out of there, ASAP, doesn't it? That they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast 
and they ate. At home, Lot prepares a feast. And yet the only ingredient of the feast that we are told is what? Not bread. Unleavened bread. Two interesting things to take note. Why unleavened bread? You <laughs> make it quickly. He doesn't have time to have it rise. Secondly, according to the text, who makes the unleavened bread? Lot. When these visitors came to Abraham, who made the bread? Sarah. Who cooked the calf? His servants. Why didn't his wife cook the unleavened bread? Could it be that maybe she did not welcome these strangers in her home? Why wouldn't she want these strangers in, in their home? Could be a couple reasons. Again, she was with Lot through all the Abraham experiences. Maybe there's something about these strangers that she knew were different, distinctive than most people. Or, like Lot, was afraid for her own safety and welfare because what? It's going to happen. Yeah, they're going to come for these strangers, as they've done before, obviously. Okay? We move on then, verses 4 through 10, verses 4 and 5. Before they'd gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Is there any man not mentioned in there? <laughs> all the men, every part of the city, old and young, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Here we have a picture of just how depraved and wicked the city of Sodom was. The scene that's depicted here is almost unbelievable as the revelation of depravity of the people in Sodom. The intent to commit homosexual rape is disgusting enough, but here we have a case in which every man of the city, old, young, from every corner, surrounded the house with the intent to commit this crime against Lot's guests. Every male in the city of Sodom were in. Okay? They were in. Another dimension to this horrible sin is the fact that old and young men as well were driven by this lust and rather to practice this terrible practice in secret, what are they doing? They are outside in the street shouting and screaming what they want to do. There was no secret. It was all open. No wonder God called the sin of Sodom very grievous. Make no mistake, the demand of all the male citizens of Sodom to know these visitors is an ancient idiom which refers to sexual activity. So, the kind of sexual activity that is depicted and described here is what? Male to male sex, okay? Which is known as homosexuality. Lot, who is obligated to protect these visitors, who he found and shelter them under his roof, acts in desperation to save his guests. Verses 6 through 8. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like to them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Here is another lay of the story, which is perhaps is more disturbing than the action of the men of Sodom. It's hard for us to understand, even with the allowance for the exaggerated custom of hospitality, 
how Lot could offer his daughters in this way. To be willing and ready to allow his two virgin daughters to be raped and ravaged all night by this crowd is both unimaginable and inexcusable. Would you agree? It's just really hard to fathom, which makes you ask yourself, why would he do that? Do you think he's aware that these are angels from the court of God? And was this an act of desperation to spare himself from judgment if these men got hold of these angels? Because again, this makes no sense. This is the, the, the ultimate betrayal of a father to his daughters, is it not? Verse 9. Get out of the way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Whatever the reason behind this strange proposal, it did not detour all the men of the city in their sexual appetite. In fact, what did it do? It made them even angrier, didn't it? Because what did they tell Lot? We're going to take these two visitors. But guess what? After them, who's next? You. And we're going to do much worse to you than we're going to do to these two visitors. So Lot's actions just upset them more. Finally, when it becomes apparent Lot could not hold the men of the city back, the angels themselves step forward and intervene. Verse 10. But the men inside reached out, pulled Lot back into the door, and shut the door. Who comes to Lot's rescue? Not just the angels, but God who sent them. Okay? Interesting. Verse 11 tells us that the angels struck the men outside with blindness. Now, this is a particular kind of blindness, much like what we read on in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. When God smit the vast entire Syrian army with blindness so that Elisha could escape. Now, this blindness that God sent to the Syrian army and this blindness the angels gave to the men of Sodom is not a lack of sight, but rather it's a blindness of confusion. They could see but they could not identify where they were, which means they could not find Lot's door to push it open. So when they were unable to find the door, ultimately, what did these men do? They go back home again. Okay. Where did they find their you know what? Don't care. That's a biblical mystery right there. <laughs> Maybe the blindness, when they, when they got close to home, the blindness left, and oh, I'm home. All right? Verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angel urges Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away and the city when the city is punished. The angel insists Lot, his wife, and two daughters leave. They make it plain. That the destruction of this city is going to come early the next morning. After the city was fully awake and aware what was happening. Before anyone in the city would leave for work, for the field, and for any other purpose. And before any person came into the city who was not a citizen of the city. What does that tell you? God was intent on bringing his punishment upon whom? Upon the people of Sodom. Upon his citizens. No one else. It was directed toward them for the sin that they committed and for the sin that they allowed to be part of their life and of their city. No other person was going to be paid for the price of their sin. They were to endure and experience it at all. 
Amazing how the angels tell them that, isn't it? That it's going to come early in the morning. Everyone's going to be awake and aware. So they'll be very aware of what's happening. But no one's going to escape it. And no foreigner or stranger is going to experience it. It is reserved for whom? For the citizens of Sodom. The angels stress the urgency of leaving without delay. Without ever looking back behind them, flee to the mountains as fast as they can. It's intriguing to read that Lot and daughters two, and, their two fian and the two fiancés refused to go. They were told, but they refused to go. Why? They thought it was a big joke. It's like, it's never going to happen. What's he talking about? What was he talking about? Even Lot tries to compromise, asking the angel to allow him to make, move into one of the smaller cities, the city of Zoar. Why? Lot was afraid he could not survive in the mountains. Why not? For a vast amount of years, where did Lot survive? In the desert. With Abraham, he was where? He was in the desert, scratching out for life. What happened to Lot? He moved into the city, and what happened? He had to work for anything. Everything was provided. So Lot, again, is comfortable it in Sodom and just doesn't see himself being able to survive in the, in the mountains. So what does God do? God grants Lot's presumptive request. He spares the city of Zoar for whose sake? For Lot's sake. Friends, you talk about forbearance. That's forbearance. Okay? As Lot and his family flee the city and reach Zoar, the Lord rains upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrows those cities and the entire plain, destroying all living things in the cities and also the visitation of the land. Now, in verse 24, it seems to suggest two persons of the Trinity we're participating. Verse 24. The Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord here is the one who made himself known to Abraham. He was the one who called down judgment. Who would that be? Who was the one who had, had fellowship with Abraham? Who has visited with Abraham? Who's talked with Abraham? He's the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, who in his pre-incarnate state took on human form when he talked to Abraham. Remember when he came with the two angels in the tent? Notice what happens. From the Lord out of the heavens. Yet the fire and brimstone comes from whom? The Lord of the heavens. Who's that? That's the Father. That's the Lord God Jehovah. So what do we have here? The judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah is what? Comes from whom? God, God the Father, God the Son. The God, the Father, and the Son are in complete agreement about what? About the punishment that has come to this city. Fire and brimstone is best explained as an electric storm. Lightning that comes from the heavens and the brimstone is again that which the, the, the uh, lightning uh, ignites, explodes, and consumes. Okay? Everyone who inhabited these four cities and everything that grew and was built around these cities was what? utterly destroyed. It's kind of like Hiroshima after the A-bomb, isn't it? Just 
Verse 26 simply records a natural calamity that happened to the wife of Lot as she very reluctantly followed her husbands and daughters out of Sodom. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Why did she look back? Yeah, where was her heart? It was still there. They were told to go, yeah, to run to the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But again, again, what is the effect of sin? But again, it's to it come, it's a, it's passed down from children, from parents to children, third, fourth generations of those who do evil. And again, uh, you know, how long was this going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? And again, we talk about young and old. So obviously, this behavior in, in, uh, in Sodom seemed to be a learned behavior, didn't it? That was embraced. This event would have captured the imagination of the original readers. Why? What body of water is Sodom very close to? And what's in the Dead Sea? Salt. <laughs> salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, uh, she becomes a pillar of salt and obviously, again, um, taken by the rain and, and everything else back to, the, to the, back to the Dead Sea. The grievous and great sin God punishes in the five plain cities is homosexuality. But here's, here's an interesting question. Specifically, does God punish homosexual rape or is he punishing same sexual encounters. Okay, okay, yeah. Now, some would try to obviously split hairs there. Yeah. But again, uh, unless one was practicing the first, they would not have pursued the second. Okay? Why is this sin so abhorrent and grievous to the Lord God Jehovah? That's the question. Here's, here's, let me present this answer and you can say agree or disagree. I know you agree, but that's okay. <laughs> it is a direct violation against the creator order of God when he created heaven and earth. When God made human beings, what did he make them? Man. Why? So a man could leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and they could become one. The created order of God is male and female. And that created order of male and female was for the purpose of recreation, populating the earth. Mm -hmm. And what was the act of which recreation came? We're adults here. Sex. All right. It's okay. You can say it. <laughs> it's, it was a sexual act, right? The sexual act was not only the, exp the greatest expression of human love, but it was the vehicle through which families were created. Now, to take that created order and violate it, what are you doing? Yeah, not only sinning, but you're taking away the way that God has planned and purpose for human beings to live and to recreate. Okay? This idea of same sex is the creature taking the role of who? The creator. It is the ultimate rebellion. God says, this is the way I've made you. The creature says what? Hey, I don't like that way. I like this way. And yet, in that way, he, the, the creature just destroys, implodes the plans and purpose God has for the continuance of this world and of human life and family. I'd like to respond to this because I don't agree with Pope Francis a lot. But I, did you hear his edict about four or five weeks ago? Pope Francis, uh, when he became Pope, he was the champion of the 
progressives and the liberals. They thought that he was going to do great change and transformation. Uh, four or five weeks ago, he made this edict and was given to the homosexual community. And I quote, we cannot bless your unions because the church cannot bless sin. Did anybody read that or hear that? Check me out on that one. But, it, you know, but I thought, when I heard that, I got, wow, wow, you know. For Pope Francis, who's supposed to be, again, the most liberal pope around, to make that statement, uh, again, that, that seems to be just a, uh, it's, 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 I think it's, it's right on. But let's be honest. We have great fear talking and discussing this topic and issue, don't we? Why? Very controversial. It's controversial. There's a lot of ignorance. And let's face it, friends, a lot of ignorance is for us, isn't it? Because we just don't understand it. It makes no sense to us. There's great disagreement, and now there is social consequence, is there not? There really, really is. In my 30 years of reading, studying, and researching this topic, um, can I share with you what I found? Now, it's not exhaustive, but it is consistent with research, with the materials, and with um, the papers written. First question, what causes homosexuality, right? That's the big one, right? I would love to give you a definitive answer, and I have one. What causes homosexuality? Nobody knows for sure, all right? That's the definitive answer. Um, it is a complex, complex issue. But there are four leading theories of what causes it. Okay? The first theory is God made me this way. This one is really popular today. Okay? The idea that homosexuals are born, not made, is embraced by, by a lot of folks. This theory is that certain genetic arrangements produce homosexual men and women. This belief then abstains them from what? Any responsibility, right? Because God made us this way, they say. As Lady Gaga says, I was born this way. It's their genetic makeup. It's not their fault. They can't change so we have to accept them and their lifestyle as an alternative lifestyle. But the truth be told, scientific evidence that homosexuals have a biological predisposition for homosexuality, while it is scant, it is not non-existent. But there is no scientific evidence that genetics or indoctrine factors are causative in homosexual behavior. Homosexuality is not a genetic issue, nor is it biological, nor is it hereditary. Okay? Theory two, mother made me this way. This theory perpetuates that destructive family dynamics early in childhood life can lead to homosexual behavior. The classic scenario, is what? The dominating mother, the weak father scenario in which mother is the captain of the ship and father rides a little dinghy being pulled behind in its wake. When a son is born into a family like this, he has few chances to learn or to see masculine behavior in his father. Instead, he learns to acquiesce to the desires and demands of his dominating mother. This undermines his masculinity. It erodes self-confidence, and he finds it difficult to relate to male peers. Female peers frighten him as his mother, so he withdraws, and he fantasizes about real men, so when he sees masculinity, he is attracted to it. One expert writes this, it is practically impossible for homosexuality to result in a human when a child has at least one 
one solid relationship with either parent. That same author lists several family dynamics which might contribute, not lead to, but contribute to homosexuality. An abusive father and smothering mother. A punitive, harsh, cruel father and an overprotective, doting mother. A passive, laid-back father and an overpowering, strong-willed mother. A vulgar father and a prudish mother. But it has to be stated, these early destructive family dynamics lead to homosexual vulnerability. But vulnerability does not necessarily lead to homosexuality. Okay? Theory three, seduction of innocence. This states that homosexuality is caused by early erotic experiences with a person of the same sex. It's interesting, in a recent study and poll taken by experts, 85% of those felt that homosexuality was a learned behavior because of early destructive family dynamics and early seduction by another person. Destructive family relationships followed with early seduction with a uncle, an older cousin, friend down the street, tips the scales toward homosexuality. And there are many who believe this is the leading cause of early sexual experience with the same sex. Because it is not only the first, but it is the one that is written on one's mind and one's heart. Theory four, it's a mystery. Some believe that homosexuality remains a mystery that no one can explain. As one man writes, even though I was raised in the church, gone to Christian school, sang in the choir, was president of a young people's society, was starting to become a minister, appeared outwardly as a model Christian, something was wrong. I was a homosexual. I don't know what caused it, but I am one. Bottom line, homosexuality may be caused by a combination of circumstances. A predisposition because of temperament, a family problem, an early experience, whatever causes it, we need to try to understand just how complex this issue is. Okay. Let me be clear. The Bible clearly forbids homosexual action. But it doesn't ever say that a homosexual temptation, a thought, or even a orientation toward it is a sin. Okay. That's, I think, really important to, to underline. Right. The feelings, the thoughts, the thinking that you're orientated toward that, the temptation for it, that is not a sin. Yeah. You think somebody could be cured? There have been many who've done that, yeah. Oh. Uh, and again, you know, there's two sides of that, too. There's this indoctrination thing where they go and just get locked up and, you know, kind of get re retrained. Uh, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's a long, hard process. There, there years ago, I went to a concert at Elon High. It was years. And the teacher was a Harvard, well-known. And he stood up and said, he said I was a Pastor Ruthann's home church, Calvary Reform, their new pastor is a, was, a homo, was a homosexual, but he also was a drug addict. So you can imagine what was going on with that, you know, in those dark, dark days. But again, came to faith and came through it. Let me end on a positive note, because I think we need to end there. What should our attitude be? toward homosexuals and to homosexual community. Because that's really where we're at now, right? First, be their friend. Jesus is calls, is, was called to be the friend of whom? Sinners. Why? Like everyone else, homosexuals are looking for unconditional acceptance. What they're asking is, can you just love me as I am? 
That's a call for what? Unconditional love. Have we received that unconditional love? I mean, God knows who we are, doesn't he? And that's not very good. He knows all of our flaws, all of our, our weaknesses, and yet what does he do? Still loves us. Truth is that most homosexuals have been rejected all their life. So they sought refuge where? In the homosexual community to get a sense of caring. The Lord Jesus Christ has a special burden for those rejected by society and living in deep pain. We are called to follow that example. Second, be informed. When you combine ignorance with passion and conviction, what do you get? Persecution and intolerance, don't you? Ignorance, with passion and conviction, you get persecution and intolerance. Make it better to combine knowledge with compassion instead. I think we need to make an effort to become informed. Avoiding the problem and the issue doesn't make it disappear, but rather only complicates it. Because when we don't gain information, when we don't try to learn and understand, what do we do? We blind ourselves, don't we? We blind ourselves to what's out there and what we need to know. Third, be understanding. Realize the complexity of this issue. I mean, this, for a person, this has taken time and a lot of different experiences. It's not nature. It's not just nurture. It's often a combination of things. And many of those things that brought them to where they are have been hurtful and painful. And we as Christians don't need to add to that pain and hurt, do we? Fourth, inspire hope. As one of Christ's disciples, as a church of Christ, we are called to love with a special love. Those who have been rejected, deposed, powerless, and without hope. And certainly, that includes many homosexuals as well, who are struggling to live in this world. I mean, that's my understanding of God's call to us, to, to this group of people, which again, initially, uh, we may have intense feelings uh, against, but again, uh, as I've gotten to know many of them, um, they're just, they're just people who are struggling. They really are. They really are. They're... Would you marry a couple? <sighs> uh, as, as a minister of the gospel, no, I couldn't. If I was a justice of the peace, I could. <laughs> no, I could. I could. But again, again, I think it's very important when we're talking about the church of Christ, the body of Christ, and the commitment we have to Christ and living under his reign and rule, there's a whole different set of dynamics than living in the world as Christians giving witness, isn't it? There's a whole different dynamics. You know. And then again, that is what, again, uh, the, the domination has struggled with and ultimately has torn us apart. Um, but again, our relations with those in the world, uh, again, is one of compassion, I think, it's of, of, of encouragement uh, and of support, because again, they are folks who just need, need love, as all of us do, as all of us do. Anyone else? Yeah? Do you attend the same secondary? No. 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 Uh, yeah, I, I should, I, do I say to I attend one? <sighs> never say never. Um, I mean... I tell you, um, 20, 30 years ago, the uh, president of New Brunswick Seminary, Dr. Help me, Ruth. No, who was the librarian? Cansfield. Cansfield. Dr. Canfield was a, uh, who I knew very well, who I knew very well at Western. He was in Western for years, became president of, 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 uh, of uh, New Brunswick the Theological Seminary. He married his daughter. Uh, with another woman. Um, the, the, the problem he did is he didn't tell his board. 
and did not have approval of his board. He was deposed as president and he was defrocked as a minister. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. That's a high price to pay. But man, it was his daughter. I, I, I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would do. I really don't. I really don't. So I, 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 I hold judgment on that. But again, I think you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes? I was invited and I went to a wedding like that mm -hmm. because I felt like they were nice people. Mm -hmm. there was, I, it's not my job to judge that form. Yeah, but, I think so. But um, I feel like if you don't go, you're rejecting them. And, and they were very nice people. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know them. Yeah. Well, you know, well, I think, you know, again, like I say, life within the Church of Christ, the responsibilities and the expectations uh, are different than life in the world as Christians who are bearers of Christ's love. Those are two very different and distinctive uh, life, you know, ways we, we need to act and respond. I, I, really, I, I, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, if, and, and not coming... Obviously, you're speaking, uh, they, they'll make a judgment about Christianity, carte blanche um, from that. So I think, you know, we're also witnesses of Christ in the world, friends. You know, and, and our witness for Christ needs to be f of what? Love. Love. A love. Church, in the church of Christ, it's about obedience, is it not? It's about, again, coming under his lordship and his leadership that he has set for us. Uh, that is a different expectation than in the world as his people radiate love and grace. At least that's how I see it. Anyone else? It's tough. It's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, homosexuals are welcome in church. Absolutely. I don't think they should be a leader. No. Again, I think the church, of, I mean, I think the church of Christ should welcome any, all, any and all. If they are ever going to to, to think about changing or, or, or whatever, it's not going to happen if they're not in the church. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, again, uh, every church is, is open to that. I, hopefully, the Reformed Church is open to that. Coming in, leadership, being part of the church, that's a whole other discussion that has to happen. Um, a couple years ago, we had Lincoln Park Days. Uh, which we uh, are in the outs uh, we have a uh, table out there for kids and uh, give out information. And I was confronted with a uh, young man who was a homosexual. Uh, he was tired of going to New York City for church, and he asked me, "Would I be welcome at your church?" And I said, "Sure, come." He goes, "Really? Would I be welcome?" You know, taunting me. I said, yeah, come on. Why don't you try it once? Uh, you know, there's churches that why I can't. They won't let me in. I said, "Well, we'll let you in. Come." So guess what? Who came Saturday? Or Sunday? He did. And the first thought I have is, what did I do? <laughs> 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 but again, again, Ruth Ann met him on Saturday. She greeted him, hugged him on, on Sunday. Another lady did the same thing. I did the same thing. And he attended worship. And you know, during the singing of the last song, he left. And I, we've never seen him since. But why? I think it was just a challenge for us. Hey, will you accept me? And when we did, what happened? Yeah, yeah. He was afraid of it. Yeah, he was afraid of it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he was looking for that hypocrite thing. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Like, it didn't happen. You know, that, uh, uh, you know, another wall that he could build up against the church and against God, and all of a sudden that came down, and, you know, I have no, no, I have no defense for that. Anybody? During uh, the winter, I have two girls that come from the bridge. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, on that issue too, there's the ideal, and then there's others than the ideal. Now, would we rather have a child live in foster care or, you know, whatever, or have two human beings who really love them and is committed to them to raise them? Yeah. I know these two women yeah. taking my yeah. kids that well. Yeah. They know it's very yeah. And, and I know some of the city of Yeah, yeah. 
You know, again, is it the ideal? No, but for that child who's been adopted, for the children that they, they, they bring in, I think, you know, they're, they're a blessing to it. And uh, confusing? Absolutely. To have two dads, two moms, absolutely. But again, uh, for kids and parents, what's the language that is most important? It's love. You know, it's caring for them. It's taking responsibility for them. And, and again, again, um, can that be done by... Uh, People of the same sex, it could be done. Yeah, it can be done. It probably could, you know. Uh, is that the ideal? No. But again, we, we live in a world that's broken by sin, friends. And what's the alternative for that child if he's not adopted? And many of these kids who are adopted, they thrive. They thrive. So that's, you know, that, that's one, again, I think we've got to be really careful with. that. The, we set the standard so high that anything other than that standard is no good. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We can't be that hypocritical. It's got to be this or nothing else. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. You know, and not only that, but again, you know, these kids too, they see other parents that are my husband and wife, so, you know, it's, it's not that this is you know, the only thing they see. Uh, but again, I think, you know, again, uh, just for a child who has been, in a, who's been given up in adoption to know that two people love them, I think that's, you know, that's, you know, yeah, that's, that, that, that's more important than I think anything else. Um, then you got to go after that. And, and again, um, many, of these, many of these families, they know the need to have father figures if they're two, two women. They know the need to have mother figures if there's two men. You know, they've got aunts and uncles uh, that, that, that they'll draw into and, and, and that kind of stuff too. Because again, I think they, they want to make sure that they are totally assimilated into culture. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? It's, uh, it's the critical issue of our age. Oh, and I think, again, we, as, as a church and as we as Christians, uh, again, we operate in, in, in two areas of life. We operate in the church under the lordship and leadership of Christ, and we'll operate in the world as witnesses of Christ's love. I think we've got to understand that, you know, uh, that's going to determine a lot of our reactions and responses. I th and it should. It should. Because the, the model of that is who? Jesus Christ. He was drawn to who? Sinners. He was drawn to the woman at the well who was living with a man. He was drawn to the lady caught in adultery. He was drawn to them. Drawn to them. And uh, again, his biggest mission was just to know, love them, to let them know they were loved with unconditional love. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking as we're talking here, but I knew a couple of students from Hope College who dated women all through Hope College. Now they're with yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, so I, that's confusing to me. I grew up, I never <clears throat> looked at women because they didn't interest me. <laughs> I mean, but, but again, but again, you know, I'm, but I'm hey. they, they were like 20, 20 years old and they, But you know, the other thing is, in this culture, too, there is a draw for it. There is a draw. I mean, it's popular. Is it experimental, too? It could be, yeah. A lot of it, that's sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's what the whole buy thing is, isn't it? Yeah. But again, and again, uh, again, it's because, again, this whole sexuality thing, if we, if a person is determines it for themselves, there's a lot of error that can happen. If they embrace the plan of God, you know, there is one path, so. Sometimes people even marry and have children and then they. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you read the Bible, it says it's a sin. A pot, so yeah. Right out and yeah. Like and so is gossip. What? So is gossip. <laughs> is, 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 the, is, is one sin worse than the other? No, it's not. No, it's not. And I don't think we as Christians want to be throwing stones to people who have do one sin and we just kind of, you know, turn our eyes over, you know, blind ourselves to what the ones that we're doing. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, it's sin, yeah. But again, um, who is the ultimate one that has to deal with sin? God. Yeah, 
and God. Yeah, absolutely. 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 And again, for a Christian to show love and compassion to someone who is, finds himself in that situation, lets them know that, again, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that our God is one who just reaches out, is reaching out to them through us. The path is open. I think that's the, you know, there's a path open if there's a moment of, of reflection and, and whatever. So, again, um, and let's be honest, in this world, in that situation, who is the only Jesus they're going to see? Exactly. And how do you want Jesus to be betrayed to them? That's the huge question right there. Yeah. yeah. Do they know that they're loved and that love is an unconditional love of God and just not of a, of a person? I think that's, that, that's huge. That's how we deal with it. Now, like I said, in the church, uh, it's a whole different, you know, there's a whole different um, issue because you're dealing with, again, um, things that we know God has called us to be and God called us to do and has empowered us to be and do by His Spirit. That's a whole different thing than out in the world where we want to be Jesus to these folks. And I think, again, doing that will kind of bring down our anxiety as well. Because, again, we now have a way that we feel comfortable of, again, expressing Jesus Christ's love to them rather than to stare, point, or talk about them when they walk away. That doesn't help our witness at all, or our heart, or our spirit. We done, Ron? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a hard lesson because it deals with an issue, Lord, that is front and center in 21st century America. And Lord, there are all kinds of, of feelings and emotions we have. Uh, First of all, because it is so new and different. And secondly, because again, Lord, uh, of your teaching in your word. And yet, Father, help us to understand that our role as, as your people is not to maintain the purity of the church or our community of our country. But Lord, it is to show the love of Jesus Christ to others. And Lord, especially to those who are hurting or struggling, who's been found, been rejected and denied, uh, who've been hurt. Lord, by uh, those who are supposed to love them and care for them. So, Father, again, we just ask and pray that you'll give us a, a loving heart and a kind spirit as we move and, and walk around in, in, in Zealand and in Holland, Lord, and in our world. Again, Lord, help us to seek a spirit of understanding rather than one of judgment. One, Lord, of, of discernment rather than, again, Lord, one of just uh, of absolutes. One where, again, Lord, love conquers and wins in, in all situations. Lord, as we deal as a denomination, as a church uh, with this issue, again, Lord, we just pray that for Pastor Jonathan and Marsha, for the consistory, Lord, that you just give them wisdom and discernment and discretion. Again, Lord, may their hearts and minds stay open to your spirit as he moves and guides and directs of, Lord, again, the, the stance we will take and, Lord, again, the action that will have to be uh, part of, uh, of our church as we move ahead uh, in uh, this 21st century. But, Father, we take hope and comfort in that you rule and, Lord, are in control, that, again, Father, you watch over us and you care for us. And, Lord, again, that... You will empower and enable us to be what you want us to be so that we can be Jesus to our world. In his name we pray. Amen.